Hey guys, welcome back to the Dead Church series. If you're new to this series, I highly suggest you start at the beginning of the series and work your way through because all of these videos are building one on top of another. You can find the link to the entire playlist right here. In the last video, we looked at some of the promises found throughout the New Testament. We talked about how many Christians think those promises are for anyone who calls themselves a Christian and they assume those promises are for them when really those promises are only for people who are living according to the commands of Jesus. Okay, the New Testament was written to Christians who were living the way we see in the early church in Acts. They were sharing everything in common. They were giving up their possessions. They were looking out for the needs of others rather than for themselves. Okay, when the New Testament gives us some of these promises, it was written to people who were living like that. It wasn't written to the modern church. Those promises are only for people who live the same way the early church lived. In this video, I want to address another one of those conditional promises. I want to look at prayer. Okay, how many times have we read or heard the following promises in Scripture? I tell you the truth, if your faith is the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. All things will be possible for you. I tell you the truth, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will be able to do what I did to this tree and even more. You will be able to say to this mountain, go, fall into the sea. And if you have faith, it will happen. If you have faith, you will get anything you ask for in prayer. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, go, fall into the sea. And if you have no doubts in your heart and believe that what you say will happen, God will do it for you. So I tell you to believe that you have received everything you ask for in prayer, and God will give them to you. These are some of the most incredible promises found in the Bible. Jesus is promising that if you have faith, you can move literal mountains through prayer. He's promising that nothing will be impossible for you. He's promising that you too can curse a fig tree and see it wither up. You can receive anything you ask for in prayer. You can live the kind of life Jesus lived. This is why we see his apostles doing the same things he did. The book of Acts says the apostles were doing many signs and wonders. Peter and John healed a cripple. Peter's recorded as healing everyone who came to him. Even Peter's shadow was healing people when it passed over them. Paul's handkerchief was being given to people and it was healing them. Peter raised the dead. Paul raised the dead. Paul healed every single person who was sick on the island of Malta. Every one of them. And the apostles weren't the only ones living a life marked by this kind of powerful prayer. Stephen was filled with power. Ananias was led by the Spirit and healed Paul. Philip performed many miracles and cast out demons. These incredible promises of Jesus proved to be true time and time again in the early church. Those who followed Jesus were heard by God. Those who followed Jesus received anything they asked for. Yet today, those promises make Christians feel uncomfortable. Christians today try to explain away these promises. They come up with excuse after excuse for why these promises aren't true in their own lives or in the lives of any other Christians they know. Today, Christians pray and often feel like they weren't heard. The power of God that defined the early church 
is missing from Christianity today. And Christians don't understand why. Over the years, I've read many books about prayer. I've heard the advice of countless Christian teachers and preachers and authors as they try to motivate Christians to pray. And depending on their background and their denomination, they have a wide array of excuses for why their prayers don't seem to be heard. Some say that it's because you only receive what you ask for if you're asking for something that's God's will. So you just have to ask. And if it's God's will, he will give it to you. And if it's not, then he won't. Others say that it's because prayer takes time to be answered, so you just have to be patient. Others insist that you just have to believe that your prayer was answered, even if it's clearly obvious that it wasn't. They claim that they healed someone when that person actually remained sick or even died. They think that if you acknowledge that a prayer wasn't answered, you curse yourself and guarantee that that prayer won't be answered because you prove that you don't have faith. So they just refuse to acknowledge the problem. They refuse to recognize that God isn't answering their prayers. And still others, they insist that their prayers do get answered, but they never ask for anything that would require any kind of miracle. They comfort themselves in the belief that their prayers are being heard when really they're only ever asking for things that are very likely to happen anyway. Guys, none of these excuses are biblical. Yet all of these Christians have their Bible verses they use to back up these beliefs. They pick Bible verses, they take them out of context, they ignore other verses that directly contradict their conclusions, and then they use these verses to defend their argument. They think they're defending the truth when they're really just defending their own beliefs and refusing to admit that maybe there's something wrong with their doctrines and theology. The early church didn't look like this. Their prayers were heard. They received what they asked for. They experienced the literal fulfillment of the promises of Jesus with no strings attached. There was no denying that their prayers were heard, and they weren't only asking for trivial things that were very likely to happen anyway. No, cripples were leaping for joy. Paralyzed people were walking home. Dead people were waking up. They experienced a life so unlike what Christians today experience. Why? Why did Jesus make such grand promises about our prayers being answered? Why do we see the early church experiencing those promises as true, yet our experience today is the exact opposite? What's wrong? In order to understand what's wrong, we need to address the lies that Christians are believing. Okay, first we need to understand faith. We've already been discussing faith throughout this series. In the Bible and in the promises Jesus gave us about prayer, the word translated faith is the Greek word pistis. And the word translated believe is rooted in that same word, pistis. Okay, the Greek word pistis didn't mean faith like we tend to think of it today. And it didn't mean believe like we think of it today. It always meant believing and obeying at the same time. It always meant faith and faithfulness and included both at the same time. It was never just one or the other. It meant loyalty. It meant fidelity. Okay, think about it this way. When you go to the bank and you see that little sign that says your deposit is protected by the full faith of the United States federal government, is it saying that your deposit is protected because the government believes in you? No, that's ridiculous. 
It's saying your money is protected by the trustworthiness and faithfulness of the U.S. government. Their faith isn't that they believe. It's that they're promising to be faithful in protecting your money. It's a good faith agreement. That's the kind of faith Jesus is talking about. And that's the version of the word faith that the Bible translators are intending. We're not supposed to be people who merely believe in Jesus and trust that he is who he says he is. We're not supposed to be people who merely believe that he will answer our prayers. We're supposed to be people he can trust too. We're supposed to be faithful. We're supposed to be loyal. When Jesus promises that if we have faith, we can move mountains, he's promising that if we are people who live in complete fidelity and loyalty to God, then we are people who will receive whatever we ask for from God. His promise isn't just about believing our prayers are answered. His promise is about what it means to be a Christian in the first place. The kind of faith that results in answered prayer is the same kind of faith that we need for salvation. It's the kind of faith where we live the kind of life God wants us to live. It's the kind of faith where we prioritize what God says is important, and we obey His commands, and we forget about anything else or anyone else other than Him. That's the kind of faith the Bible talks about. And we can see in many places that it's the kind of faith we're supposed to have when we're talking about prayer. Okay, for example, when thinking about prayer, a lot of Christians think about verses like these. In Christ, we have access to God with boldness and with confidence. We can do this through faith in Christ. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He was tempted in every way that we are, but he did not sin. Let us then confidently approach God's throne of grace. There we can receive mercy and find grace to help us when we need it. So, brothers and sisters, we have confidence to enter the most holy place without fear by means of the blood of Jesus' death. We can enter through a new and living way that Jesus opened for us. It leads through the curtain, Christ's flesh. And since we have a great priest over God's house, let us come near to God with a sincere heart and a confident faith because we have had our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies have been washed with pure water. My dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Christians look at verses like these and they get encouraged. They read these and think, I can have confidence before God. I can come before God boldly. I have free access to God now because of Jesus. And while yes, that is true, it's only true for those who are true followers of Jesus. People today hear a gospel preached that says you can be saved without doing anything. They believe in a message that says you are a Christian if you believe in Jesus and it's entirely based on whether or not you believe the correct information. They accept this gospel and then they think that all the promises in the New Testament are for them. But there's a problem. That's not the gospel preached in Scripture. Scripture says that you must obey Jesus or you aren't saved. Scripture says that you must live your life obeying the commands of Jesus or you aren't a Christian at all. And if you're not actually a Christian, then those promises aren't for you, even if you think you are a Christian. Jesus said, 
Not all those who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants. On the last day, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and did many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who practice lawlessness. Everyone who hears my words and obeys them is like a wise man who built his house on rock. It rained hard, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. But it did not collapse because it was built on rock. Everyone who hears my words and does not obey them is like a stupid man who built his house on sand. It rained hard, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it collapsed with a big crash. Jesus is clear. Not all who call him Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only those who obey his commands, those who do what God wants. If they are calling him Lord, but he's telling them, I never knew you, and sending them away from him, were they really Christians? They clearly thought they were. They called him Lord. They prophesied. They cast out demons in his name. They did many things in his name. But Jesus never knew them. If Jesus never knew them, then they never really were Christians. And they never actually had the life they thought they had. In Matthew 25, 31 to 46, Jesus tells a parable where he says that on the last day, he will separate people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He tells the sheep to enter into rest because they obeyed his commands. And he tells the goats to depart from him and sends them into eternal punishment because they did not obey his commands. He didn't separate them based on what information they accepted as true. He separated them based on what they did. True saving faith is about fidelity. It's about loyalty. It's about living a radical life of obedience to the commands of Jesus. Jesus is saying anyone who doesn't live that way isn't actually a Christian even if they think they are. So here's the thing. If those people aren't actually Christians, then those people can't confidently approach the throne of God. They don't have free access to God. The access to God that's available through Jesus is not available to them because they didn't join themselves to Jesus in fidelity. They didn't choose to begin obeying his commands. Christians today read some of these grand promises in scripture and they assume those promises are for them, but they don't accept the lifestyle that Jesus says you have to live in order to be his follower. They don't recognize that those verses were not written to American Christians who live cushy American lives and pursue the American dream. Those verses and those promises were written to the early church, to people who gave up everything in order to follow Jesus, people who shared everything in common, who looked out for one another more than they looked out for themselves, who hated the things of this world and lived simple, humble lives so that their resources could go toward helping their brothers and sisters. The promise of free access to God is for people like that. It's not for people who just call Jesus Lord, but refuse to obey what he says to do. This is what John said about it. Here is the message we have heard from Christ and now proclaim to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. 
So if we say we have fellowship with God, but we continue living in darkness, we are liars and do not follow the truth. But if we live in the light as God is in the light, we can share fellowship with each other. Then the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from every sin. Look at what John is saying. He's saying God is light. He's in the light. Everything around him is light and there is no darkness whatsoever. So if you say you have fellowship with God, if you say you can come before him with confidence, if you say you have free access to God, if you say you can be heard by God, but you're in the darkness, then you're a liar and you don't follow the truth. Why? Because God isn't in the darkness. If you're still in darkness, you can't come before God with confidence because He's not there with you. But if we live in the light, just like God is in the light, then we can have fellowship with Him. Then we can come before Him with confidence. Then we have free access to Him and our prayers are heard. It's not a promise for those who live in the darkness. It's only a promise for those who live in the light. And living in the light is not about believing in Jesus. Living in the light means obeying His commands. John says this, Anyone who claims, I am in the light, but hates a brother or sister, is still in the darkness. Whoever loves a brother or sister lives in the light, and there is no cause of stumbling in him. But whoever hates a brother or sister is in darkness, lives in darkness, and does not know where to go because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Saying, I am in the light, doesn't mean you're actually in the light. You're only in the light if you love the brothers and sisters. Not with the world's love, but with God's love. John clarifies what true love is many times throughout his letter, and we've discussed those verses throughout this series. Okay, You are only in the light and have access to God and can come before Him with confidence if you live in God's radical love. The kind of love Jesus showed for us, where you drop everything and look out for others before looking out for yourself. That's what it means to live in the light. Anyone who claims to have fellowship with God but doesn't live this way is a liar. They don't have the fellowship with God that they think they have. They don't follow the truth. Christians today don't understand why their prayers aren't being answered because they don't understand that these promises are not for them. These promises are only for those who live in the light, radically loving without concern for themselves, obeying the commands of Jesus. In other words, these promises are only for those who love Jesus. Jesus said, Those who have my commands and obey them are the ones who love me. And my Father will love those who love me. I will love them and will reveal myself to them. If people love me, they will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Jesus says the only ones who actually love him are the ones who obey his commands. Anyone who refuses to obey his commands doesn't actually love him. If that's what Jesus says it means to love him, then ask yourself, can someone be a Christian without loving Jesus? Can someone have fellowship with God and enter into His presence if they don't love Him? John said, loving God means obeying His commands. Okay, Christians shouldn't expect their prayers to be answered if they're not obeying the radical commands of Jesus. Because if they're not obeying Him, they prove they don't love Him. That means they're not really Christians. And if they're not really Christians, then they can't come before God with confidence. 
If they're not really Christians, then they don't have free access to God. If they're not really Christians, they're still living in the darkness, and God is not in the darkness. That's what John is trying to get us to understand throughout his letter. And this, this teaching about prayer is something found all throughout the Bible. God doesn't listen to the prayers of people who refuse to obey what he tells them to do. Here are some examples. When you raise your arms to me in prayer, I will refuse to look at you. Even if you say many prayers, I will not listen to you. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Stop doing the evil things I see you do. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Help the orphans. Stand up for the rights of widows. When God said this to Israel, he said that they were still bringing him sacrifices. They were keeping his feasts. They were worshiping him. They were coming to his temple. They were keeping the Sabbath. They were having holy meetings. But he said he wouldn't listen to their prayers. Why? Because they were living wrong. Their lives were consumed with themselves. He told them to wash themselves and make themselves clean. Okay, that's the same thing John says in 1 John 1. John says that if we live in the light, then the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from every sin. But in Isaiah, he says what that means. Okay, he tells them to change their action. Cleansing themselves of their sin is not just about receiving forgiveness, it's about no longer living in that sin. And John is saying the same thing Isaiah is saying. You are not living in the light if you continue living the wrong way. And in Isaiah 1, God is telling them that he will not listen to their prayers because they have not cleansed themselves. They're still consumed with themselves. They don't look out for others. Love does not define their lives. He told them that if they want their prayers to be heard, they should stop doing wrong. They should do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, help orphans, help widows. It's the same thing John said in 1 John 1. And he says again, You do what pleases yourselves on these fast days, and you are unfair to your workers. Even when you fast, you argue and fight and hit with wicked fists. You cannot do these things as you do now and believe your prayers are heard in heaven. Is this the fast that I want? Do I want a day when people afflict themselves? I don't want people just to bow their heads like a plant, stretching out on sackcloth and ashes. Is this what you call a fast? Do you really think this pleases the Lord? I will tell you the kind of fast I want. Free the people you have put in prison unfairly and undo their chains. Free the oppressed and stop their hard labor. Share your food with the hungry and bring poor homeless people into your own homes. When you see someone who has no clothes, give him yours and don't refuse to help your own relatives. Then your light will shine like the dawn, and your wounds will quickly heal. Your righteousness will walk before you, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then you will call out, and the Lord will answer. You will cry out, and He will say, Here I am. He says again, Surely the Lord's hand is not too short to save you. He can hear you when you ask Him for help. It is your evil that has separated you from your God. Your sins cause Him to hide His face from you, so He does not hear you. Here's another example. Whoever ignores the poor when they cry for help will also cry for help and not be answered. Here's one more. 
when I called to them, they would not listen. So when they called to me, I would not listen. Okay, these are just a few examples. The message of the prophets contains this message time and time again. The Israelites thought they were God's people. They brought him sacrifices. They worshiped him. They fasted and they prayed. But their prayers weren't answered because the way they were living was evil in God's eyes. God is in the light, but the Israelites were in the darkness. The message of the prophets did not become irrelevant in the New Testament. Peter tells us to closely follow what the prophets said as if we were following a light in a dark place. Their message is the same for us. God is still looking for those who obey his commands. He still only promises to answer the prayers of those who live their lives for him, obeying him no matter the cost. Here are some examples from the New Testament. Jesus said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask anything you want and it will be done for you. We're very familiar with the times Jesus said, if you have faith, you can ask anything you want and it'll be done for you. Here, Jesus says the exact same thing, but he says it slightly differently. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask anything you want and it'll be done for you. But it's the same promise because having faith means having fidelity. It means loyalty. It means you obey. And as we saw in the last video, abiding in him means obeying him. It means you have fidelity. It means you have loyalty. John said, the people who obey God's commands abide in God and God abides in them. So when Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask anything you want and it'll be done for you. He's saying, if you obey my commands and if my commands live in you, they're in your life, they consume your life, they're living in you, then you can ask anything you want and it'll be done for you. Jesus is saying the same thing the prophet said to Israel. And John says it directly. John says, My dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And God gives us what we ask for because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. Again, God gives us what we ask for because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. John is clear throughout the context of this verse and the whole letter of 1 John that God's commands are about loving others, meeting their needs, loving through action, laying down our lives, helping the brothers and sisters. And here, John is saying that if we live like that, we will receive what we ask for from God. And we will receive what we ask for from God because we live like that. According to John, our prayers are answered and we receive whatever we ask because we obey God's commands. We receive what we ask because we live in love. We meet the needs of others. We prioritize the lives of others above our own comfort, our own needs, and our own lives. We receive what we ask for if we live like Jesus lived, laying down our lives for our brothers and sisters, living in the light. James also says the same thing. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being just like us. He prayed that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Then Elijah prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the land produced crops again. James is saying that our prayers can have the same power as Elijah's prayers. 
Elijah stopped the rain for over three years through his prayers. And then he prayed again and it began to rain. Our prayers can have that same kind of power. But James didn't say the prayer of someone who believes is powerful and effective. He didn't say the prayer of someone who accepts the correct information is powerful and effective. He said the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Okay, it's the prayer of a righteous person. That's the kind of prayer that has power. A righteous person is someone who does what is right. John says, Dear children, do not let anyone deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. John says that a righteous person is someone who does what is right. That means, James is saying, the prayer of someone who does what is right is powerful and effective like Elijah's prayer. If you want your prayer to be powerful and effective like Elijah's prayer, then you have to live right. You have to change your actions. You have to live a life that is pleasing to God where you obey His commands and live in radical love and stop looking out for yourself. Peter says the same thing. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and His ears on their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Again, the Lord listens to the prayers of those who live the way God says is right. But He does not listen to the prayers of those who do what God says is evil. The promise that our prayers will be heard and that we will receive whatever we ask is contingent on us living the kind of life God commands us to live. This is, again, the same thing the prophet said, the same thing James said, the same thing John said, and the same thing Jesus said. If you want your prayer to be powerful and effective like Elijah, then you have to live your life doing what God says is right. You have to obey His commands. You have to live the kind of life that He approves of. You have to abide in Him. The promises from Jesus that our prayers will be answered if we have faith are all saying that our prayers will be answered if we have fidelity, loyalty, and faithfulness. Jesus was saying our prayers will be answered if we live our lives in complete submission and obedience to Him. John said the same thing. James said the same thing. Peter said the same thing. Why? Because that's when we're living in the light. And we can only have fellowship with God and enter into His presence with confidence if we are also living in the light. If you are not obeying Him, then you are not a Christian. And if you are not a Christian, then you don't have free access to God through Jesus. This is the consistent message taught throughout all of Scripture, both the Old and the New Testaments. So then why is it something I've never once heard any Christian teacher even mention? Why do Christian teachers ignore these verses? Why do they focus on the outlying verses, take them out of context, make them say something different, and then tell us that that's what the Bible teaches? Why? Because they care more about their Protestant theology than they do what the Bible actually says. If God only listens to the prayers of those who obey His commands, like John directly says, then Protestant theology has some major holes in it. The fundamentals of Protestant theology stand on the foundation that our actions play no role whatsoever in our relationship with God. They believe that you can become a Christian and have a full relationship with God and be heard by God simply by believing in the correct information. These verses completely contradict that. So, they completely ignore the verses that prove their theology is wrong. 
Not only did they ignore them, but they refused to even draw attention to them. I recently skimmed through a very popular book on prayer. I found the chapter that was addressing these extraordinary promises of Jesus that we can receive anything we ask for as long as we have faith. And I looked through that chapter to get a feel for what that so-called teacher was teaching. He had a whole chapter on why we should receive what we ask for in prayer. And he didn't even mention 1 John 3.22, where John says that God gives us what we ask for because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. He didn't even mention it. It directly addresses the issue he claimed to be addressing, yet he didn't even mention it. And it's not just him. I spent 25 years sitting in the institutional Protestant church, listening to the teachings of men, learning from them, following them, and trusting them. I read countless books on prayer and listened to dozens or hundreds of sermons on prayer. Yet I hadn't ever once heard anyone mention this verse. Not one time. They're not teaching the Word of God. They're teaching their own theology. And this verse doesn't fit their theology, so they don't mention it. My people, your guides lead you astray and turn you from what is right. You keep saying we are wise because we have the teachings of the Lord. But actually, those who explain the scriptures have written lies with their pens. These wise teachers rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom is in them? They will be humiliated. They will be shocked and trapped. Stay away from the Pharisees. They are blind guides. And if a blind person guides a blind person, both will fall into a pit. Woe to you, you experts on the law. You have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves did not enter, and you stopped others from entering too. When these teachers talk about prayer and try to address the fact that their prayers aren't being answered like Jesus promised, they very often turn to one single verse as their answer. They turn to 1 John 5, 14 to 15. And this is the confidence we have before God, that if we ask for anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us in whatever we ask, we know we have what we ask from him. These teachers use this verse as an excuse to negate all of the other extraordinary promises in the Bible. They say that this verse means you can't really know if you'll receive what you ask for because it might not be God's will. They say you should just start making more and more requests because every now and then you'll make one that does line up with God's will and you'll see that prayer get answered. Essentially, they say that praying according to God's will is like shooting at a moving target in the dark. You can't know that you're going to get it. You just know that if it's God's will, then you'll get it. And they encourage you to just keep shooting because occasionally some of those shots will hit the target. John began this verse by saying, this is the confidence we have before God. So John is trying to tell us how much confidence we can have. That's the best they think he's saying? This is the confidence we have before God that sometimes when we ask for something, it'll line up with his will and we will receive what we ask for. Sometimes. What kind of confidence is that? That's not confidence. And every Christian who has ever accepted their teaching knows there's no confidence in it. That's why most Christians don't expect their prayers to get answered. They think they're shooting blindly at a moving target. They think praying according to God's will is some mystery that they'll never be able to know for sure if they're in His will or not. 
This verse is used as an excuse because those teachers don't see their own prayers getting answered the way Jesus said they should. They take this one verse and they overwrite all of the other verses in the Bible about how we should expect to see our prayers get answered. And they just say, we have to just submit it to God's will. If it's His will, it'll happen. And if it's not His will, then it won't. That's not biblical. Praying according to God's will is not supposed to be something where we shoot blindly at a target, never sure if it's God's will or not, never sure if our prayers will be answered or not. Jesus said we should receive everything we ask. When He said everything, He meant everything. And we see that demonstrated in the early church throughout the book of Acts. Praying according to God's will is not a mystery. It's not something that's supposed to leave us guessing. God's will is a phrase that simply means what God wants. And the Bible tells us what God wants. The entire Bible teaches us what God wants, what He cares about, what He wants us to be doing, what He values. Most Christians don't know God's will simply because they don't read the Bible in order to learn. Most Christians don't know God's will simply because they spend so much time listening to other teachers that they don't even realize those teachers were not sent by God in the first place. John calls them the Antichrist. There's nothing to learn from them. But they trust those teachers and they never get around to learning what the Bible itself actually says. Okay, this is what the Bible says. Paul says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since God has shown us great mercy, I urge you to offer your lives as a living sacrifice to Him. Your offering must be holy and pleasing to Him, which is the true way for you to worship. Do not be conformed to this world. Instead, be transformed by a new way of thinking. Then, you will be able to discern what is God's will. You will know what is good and pleasing to Him and what is perfect. Those who obey God's commands, they offer their entire lives as a living sacrifice to God, they stay holy, they live pleasing to God, they don't conform to this world and they're transformed by a new way of thinking. Their prayers are answered, just like Jesus promised, with no strings attached. Why? Because those who live that way will be able to discern what is God's will. They will know what God wants. They will know what is good, what is pleasing to Him, and what is perfect. They are not shooting blindly at a moving target. They know His thoughts. They know His mind. They know His will. There's no question as to whether or not it's something God wants. So this verse where John says that we have to pray according to God's will, it's not a verse that can be used as an excuse for your prayers not being answered. You're supposed to know God's will. If you don't know God's will, something is wrong with the way you're living because Paul said that if you live correctly, you will become capable of knowing God's will. John isn't trying to tell people that they can't be sure if their prayers will be answered because they can't be sure if it's God's will or not. No, he's saying the exact opposite. He's trying to give them confidence. He's trying to tell them that they can be confident that their prayers will be answered. Jesus didn't say, if you have faith, you can say to this mountain, be thrown into the sea and it will be done for you if it's God's will. No. Jesus said that if you have faith, as in loyalty, fidelity, and faithfulness, where you wholeheartedly abandon this world and cling only to Jesus and live only for God and no longer live for yourself, then you can ask for anything and it will be done for you, period. 
Why? Because you know what God wants. You know what He cares about, and you want what He wants. You ask for the things He wants because you want those things too. You live in the light as He is in the light. You walk by the Spirit just like Jesus walked by the Spirit. You are one with God in the same way that Jesus was one with God. The promises in the New Testament about prayer are promises about the new life we have when we're born again. Our prayers will be answered because we're in the light. We're walking by the Spirit. We want what God wants. Our very nature changes. These promises about prayer stand on the same conditions we saw in the last video about receiving the Holy Spirit. Why? Because those conditions are what it means to be a Christian in the first place, and all of the promises in the New Testament are only for people who are true Christians. They're not promises for all the false brothers and sisters that Jesus and the apostles warned us would fill the church. They're not promises for apostate believers. They're only promises for those who take up their cross and follow Jesus to death. They're only promises for people who truly accept the cost of following Jesus and give up everything in order to be his disciple. They're only promises for people who no longer live for themselves but live for him. It's not about just believing hard enough. We have to walk in the light. We have to be one with Christ. We have to be joined to Him and receive His new nature so our old thoughts, our old ways, and our old desires leave us. If we say we have fellowship with God but we walk in darkness, we're liars. But if we receive His Spirit, not just manifestations or power, but the transformation of a new heart with new desires, then we will begin to walk in the light. Walking in the light means obeying His commands and living the way He wants us to live. And if we're obeying His commands, then we know that we have whatever we ask, because if we're obeying His commands, then we have fellowship with God because we're also in the light where God is. This is such an important teaching that is largely missing in the church today. There's a lot of preachers who teach that Christians should be able to receive whatever they ask for in prayer, but they don't understand or at least preach that those Christians can only receive what they ask if they're walking in the light and obeying Jesus. They don't teach people what it means to receive a new heart and become one with Jesus. They don't teach what it means that we should be people who when we do things, it's not really us doing them, but Jesus doing it through us. They don't teach that people need to change first. They think that faith means believing something, so they teach that people just need to start believing that they have fellowship with God. They're assuming that everyone who calls themselves a Christian is a true Christian. So then they try to teach unrepentant sinners how to walk in the power of a Holy Spirit that they haven't yet received. Guys, if someone is still living in darkness, they don't have fellowship with God. That person should not expect their prayers to be answered because they don't live in the light. They are not one with Jesus and they don't abide in Him. Being one with God and being like Jesus is more than just having power and performing signs and wonders. It means your desires change. You want what God wants. You care about what He cares about. You do what He would do and you love with His love. Often we look at the book of Acts and we just want the power. But the primary job of the Spirit is to give us a new heart, to write the law on our hearts. If we don't have a new heart, we don't have the Spirit. And if we don't have the Spirit, we can't walk in the power of the Spirit.
The Spirit is our new nature. He is what causes us to not want the things of the world, but to want what God wants. So if we still want this world, and if we still want what is evil, we need to stop asking God for the power we read in Acts, and we need to start asking God for the new heart. If we have the Spirit living in us, we should stop wanting evil. That was the primary mission of the Spirit from the beginning. The promise of the new covenant was that He would write the law on our hearts. He would make us people who no longer want what God hates, but instead we would want what He wants. Paul said, Christ died for all so that those who live would no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and was raised from the dead. This explains a lot of the problems in the church today. We read in Acts about the unstoppable church, and so many Christians long for those days to return. They want to see the Spirit moving. They want to see the sick healed. They want to see the dead raised. They want to command demons to leave people. They want to see thousands or millions converted. They want the power of God moving in their lives. But they don't want the cost of following Jesus. They don't want to give up their American lifestyle. They don't want to give up the things of this world. They don't want to give up their comfort. They want to keep prioritizing themselves. They want to meet their own needs, reach their own preferred standard of living, and then they'll help others when they're able. Christians today are trying to gain all the benefits of a life with God, but they don't want the cost, he said, comes with it. The church today has a problem in that Christians either avoid talking about the power of God entirely and convince themselves that those things don't happen anymore, or they focus entirely on having the power of God and they ignore the cost of following Jesus. They want to have an experience. They want it for themselves. But they don't want to change their lives and give up their comfort. And as a result, we have a modern church where the sick are rarely healed. The dead are almost never raised. The lost are convinced that God doesn't even exist despite living in a so-called Christian country. And Christians often seem to only encounter God when they're singing songs with loud music and flashing lights. The same ingredients that would create a spiritual experience at any secular rock concert. This is not the kind of Christianity God offered us. God is offering us so much more than this. In the book of Acts, we read about an unstoppable church. The apostles performed many signs and miracles. There were no needy people in the church. They faced persecution with boldness. They spread the gospel into many different countries in just a few short years, and countless people were getting saved everywhere they went. Nothing could stop them. Satan was backpedaling, desperately trying to slow down the advance of God's kingdom. But today, at least in the western part of the world, we have a church that's mostly stopped dead in their tracks. Guys, this can change. The stories we read about in Acts don't have to be just stories. That kind of life is available for every follower of Jesus. It's available for me. It's available for you. But you must get up and follow Him. You must do what He did. You must do what He told us to do. You must trust Him. Jesus promised us, don't fear, little flock, because your Father wants to give you the kingdom. God wants to give us the kingdom. He wants to use us. He wants to have a relationship with us. 
He's looking for people to go work the harvest. But what's the very next thing Jesus says? Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Get for yourselves purses that will not wear out, the treasure in heaven that never runs out, where thieves can't steal and moths can't destroy. Your heart will be where your treasure is. The Father wants to give you the kingdom. So get your heart in the right place. Your heart will be wrapped up wherever your treasure is. So stop treasuring this life and this world and start treasuring God's kingdom. How do you store up treasure in heaven? By going to church? By reading your Bible? By praying? No, Jesus told us how. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Every time Jesus ever talked about treasure in heaven, he always said you get it by selling your possessions and giving to the poor. Okay, it's when you obey his commands. It's when you love with a radical love. Then you have treasure in heaven. And when you have treasure in heaven, you will start to value his kingdom more than this world. When we begin to obey his commands, we will begin to treasure his kingdom more because he will come reveal himself to us. He will come make his home with us and show us how worthwhile he really is. He will come and live in us, talk to us, lead us, provide for us, teach us, answer our prayers, protect us, and so much more. We will recognize the treasure that is buried in that field and realize how worthwhile it is to sell everything to get it. The more we begin to obey, the more we will know Him. And the more we know Him, the more we will want to obey. God is offering us so much more than just eternal life. It's not that eternal life isn't an incredible gift, it totally is, but so many Christians think that Jesus died just so that we can go to heaven someday, and they ignore the fact that he wanted to have a real relationship with us today, in this life. God is offering us a real relationship with the one who created the universe. If we're united in fellowship with Him, nothing can stop us, nothing can stand in our way, nothing can crush us, and nothing can overwhelm us. With Him on our side, we're more than conquerors. If we are joined to Jesus, we have died with Him and we've been raised with Him. Scripture says we're a new creation. Our old life, that life where we used to care about this world and the temporary pleasures of this world, that life is gone. We have something so much better. We get the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. We get the mind of Christ. We get to come into the presence of God with confidence, knowing that he listens to our prayers and answers them. Our Christian lives don't have to be dry, lacking passion, feeling like we're missing something and full of unanswered prayers. Christians can experience God today like they did in the early church. But we must accept the cost of following Jesus. And we must begin to obey the commands He gave us in Scripture. And then we can come before God with confidence. We can have fellowship with God and we can receive anything we ask for in prayer.